Every great city has its tales, and I've been documenting their stories and people for over 20 years. This is Tales of a City. Good evening and welcome to another episode of Tales of a City. Tonight's tale comes from Melbourne in the late 1800s. It's the story of Martha Needle, one of history's worst serial killers. And I caught up with Dr. Samantha Battams, author of The Secret Art of Poisoning, to tell us more about Martha. So thank you for being with us here tonight, uh, Dr. Samantha Battams, author of The Secret Art of Poisoning. Thanks very much for having me, Jethro. You're very welcome. Now, The Secret Art of Poisoning has a detailed study of Martha Needle, the well-known Australian serial killer, for want of a better word. Tell us all about Martha. Yeah, so when people talk about Martha, they say that she's Australia's worst female serial killer. Mm -hmm. She was actually one of five women hanged in the old Melbourne jail. So there are only five women hanged there and one hanged in South Australia. But she was actually from South Australia and she committed her crimes in Victoria. So she was actually convicted for killing her fiancé's brother. Mm -hmm. But when she was convicted for that, it was linked to her attempting to murder another of her fiancé's brothers. All right. And also they ended up digging up um, the bodies of her ex, well, her husband and two of her children, and they all had poisoning in them. Right, so after having already been caught, they exhumed the bodies yes. only to find that she was a serial killer. Uh, yes, that's right. So they exhumed the bodies of her fiancé's brother and her husband and two children and they found arsenic poisoning in all of the bodies. It would have been a sensational story back then. It was absolutely throughout all of the newspapers in South Australia, mm. in uh, Victoria, all around Australia, but also it was in New Zealand and it was also mentioned in the New York Times. I can well imagine. Mm. So. Living conditions in Melbourne at the turn of the century were unbearable. People struggled just to make a living and get by. The slums in Richmond were the home of Martha and she found life extremely difficult. The Melbourne Martha lived in was a far cry from the multicultural metropolis it is today. Back then, society frowned on scandal, let alone a female serial killer. The information of the day was only available in the newspapers, and public opinion was the judge, jury and executioner of people such as Martha. Not much has changed, really. Um, it occurs to me that should, had Martha committed those crimes in this day and age, do you think that there would have been um, a, a different outcome for Martha or she would have been viewed differently? Well, it's interesting because there was a similar case here in South Australia, the Emily Perry case, mm -hmm. and it was alleged that she poisoned um, some of her um, previous partners. But it, it did seem that it was easier perhaps in those days for someone to get away with such crimes. She actually did have to sign a poisons book with a witness 
to get um, arsenic and it was actually in a product called Rough on Rats which was used in households for poisoning rats. Um, so, and the equivalent today of rat sack. Yes, but it had arsenic poisoning, so it was extremely dangerous and it wow. was used by um, others at the time. Do you think that um, this was, uh, her crimes were a case of mental health or were they uh, premeditated for other reasons. What was their motivation? Well, it was a really complex case when I actually had a look into it. There are a number of things going on. Um, one of the things, she actually had a very, very troubled background. So she was severely um, physically, sexually and emotionally abused as a young person. And her um, s stepfather was actually convicted um, for abuse, for uh, abuse of her when she was young. And um, that was a case in um, the courts in South Australia um, but actually it did seem that there was a combination of uh, mental health issues going on mm. and one of the things that um, seemed to occur was that the poison would be administered quite slowly so incremental doses in, yes yeah, so she was actually she had a poor relationship with her one of um, her fiance's brother because she had um, what was described as an uncontrollable temper and he was the oldest in the family, the um, father having died. So he was actually really trying to protect his younger brother and didn't want his younger brother to marry Martha. He didn't approve. He did not approve and he wrote back to his mother saying, you know, how concerned he was about their match. And then um, the mother was also against the match. And um, so the fiance was talking about, you know, breaking off the engagement with Martha and she was very angry. She actually said, um, you know, she had to walk all the way to the Barossa Valley from Melbourne to um, kill her potential mother-in-law, then she would do so. So she had a very, very fiery... I, I would call <laughs> that premeditated. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, but on the other hand, um, it seemed that it was a very strange to understand about the children. So when um, she, her children died, it was after her husband had um, passed away and it was when um, a, a man by the name of Otto Yunkin, who became her fiance, started visiting her and then suddenly her children became sick um, and then the sicker her children were, the more frequent his visits. But it seemed to me that she had something which used to be called Munchausen's by proxy, where she was getting attention mm -hmm. from people being ill. So the relationship between her fiancé's brother and her vastly improved when he became sick and she started caring for him. I see. And miraculously improved. I see. So she was getting a lot of attention from caring for people whilst they were ill, which is a classic part of Munchausen's um, by proxy. Well, that she, she was actually taking very strong um, drugs which were readily available at, at the, the time. Counter. Over the counter. Mm. So, Such as what? Um, well, know. things like um, chlorodine and um, a mixture which had um, opiates in them and they actually mm. were linked at the time to um, cases of um, psychosis. There was actually ac actually in the British Medical Journal documented cases of the kind of drugs that she was taking being linked to um, psychotic episodes. Mm. So that was one factor and they were meant to be hallucinogenic. Right. And um, she also uh, appeared to have a kind of catatonia. So um, she heard voices, she heard voices of her dead children. She didn't recognise her fiancé at one stage. She was in a catatonic state for hours on end. Um, so it did seem to suggest that she had some kind of psychosis as well. So it was extremely um, complicated case when you had a look I into it. I can imagine. Mm. And I do imagine it would have been... Had it occurred in this day and age, um, yes. it would have been treated completely differently. We now know of such mm. conditions. Mm. Back then, yep. the knowledge of uh, mental health um, and drug abuse would yes. have been very minimal, I imagine. Yeah, that, that is the case. But there was also um, a penal reform society that was trying to advocate um, to the um, Premier um, and Governor of the day to try and have, you know, the, the um, conviction um, repealed because they were aware of her, the mental health issues but interestingly her lawyer didn't really pursue that and he was kind of dissuaded to by the judge mm. of the day as well when he went along that path um, the judge was um, 
quite um, sceptical. Unreceptive. Unreceptive and, mm. and was kind of steering um, away. But of course at the time you had the newspapers talking about... Sensationalising. ...how she was... Um, the French were manipulatrice, which we don't have a, an equivalent in mm. English, a female um, manipulator who was um, a very cunning indeed, mm. who you know had this big plan, um, but it was hard to believe when you actually heard some of the witnesses describe her mental health state. Mm. Mm. It's interesting to note, I read somewhere that um, she had the same lawyer as Le Ned Kelly. Yes, that's right. Mm. And uh, he didn't seem to do such a great job. No, he did. I have to, to say, on both cases. <laughs> Indeed. I, I wouldn't be thinking of him as my lawyer. No, no. He was actually one of these... Um, he was almost like a celebrity lawyer. He so he the... actually um, was very entertaining. He told mm. a lot of jokes in court and he was making the courtroom laugh. So it was a kind of entertainment, um, in a way, at, at the time. And also, they had had an effigy um, of her in a waxworks and um, her lawyer had to ask for that effigy to be taken down because of course there wasn't TV or radio so people no. would go along to the local waxworks and she was in the Chamber of Horrors <laughs> and so he wasn't really supporting her cause for all this um, activity around I her can case. well imagine. Mm. Now she was hanged in Old Melbourne Jail um, and of course that's where Ned Kelly met his final days and his final words were such as life. Do you remember what hers were? She said that she was innocent of the charge mm. and so she maintained her innocent to the end but just before she died she was asked if she had anything to say and she ha said that she had nothing to say. However, interestingly, she had a big fight with the... Um, pastor of the jail the night before who was trying to get a confession out of her and he got confessions from um, another uh, woman who was um, hanged for similar poisoning crimes and um, he was you know sort of trying to appeal to her religious nature mm. and said um, that her fiance believed um, that she had committed the crimes which deeply upset her and um, so that was her main concern she wanted her fiance to think that um, you know she was she was innocent but the um, state library has a copy of her last Bible and she seems to underline some interesting passages, uh, passages which suggests that she may have admitted to herself that um, you know she was responsible for some of these crimes. Well it's an awful tale. It is um, a terrible even tragic if it was tale. All those years ago mm. it would be just as awful today. Mm. Um, I, I think of Martha and uh, I can only imagine what life would have been like for a woman of her, her age yes. at that time living in Australia and the choices that she would have had. Now that I know mm, that she mm. of course had um, not only psychological mm, problems but mm. um, drug and substance yes. ab abuse issues, mm. I can only imagine what it must have been like to have been driven to that point of murder. Yes, yeah, so she was, um, her family was in and out of the destitute asylum here in South Australia. So as she was um, growing up, she was actually went to work when she was 12 years old. So mm. at the court case, um, uh, when she was a 12 year old, she was, you know, asked about, you know, essentially what had happened to her. And she basically went from there to work. So she worked from 12 years old for a family out at um, Port Adelaide. And um, from there, the pathway was really for marriage. Of course, there was no welfare. Mm. There was no secondary school for girls. So the secondary school for girls was introduced by Catherine Helen Spence um, in about 1875. And um, that, um, yeah, that was a difficult time in, in Martha's life. Um, it would have been for any woman, I would imagine, living yeah, in that period. Yeah. What attracted you to Martha's story? Well, I came across the story when I was researching my second book, which was on the pioneer aviator Harry Butler. Mm -hmm. And in 1920, the Smith brothers on their epic flight landed in Harry Butler's airport in Easter 1920. Mm -hmm. 
and I was reading these old newspapers and I came across this story that seemed um, just as big as or bigger than the Smith brothers arrival in their home state and that was about um, a, a murder in a small town called Rhiney here in South Australia and someone who looked like an upstanding citizen in his railway outfit um, was accused of murdering his wife and three of his seven children. Mm -hmm. Now pictures of the children in the paper and at the time that was the biggest um, case of mm -hmm. the day and it was a very unusual crime at the time and I wondered how could this be, three of seven children, what was going on? And that led you to investigate further? Yeah, I actually found out um, there was a site on the internet called Macabre uh, Melbourne and someone at the bottom of a blog um, had put that Alexander Newland Lee, who had committed these crimes in Rhiney, was the nephew of one Martha Needle, the famous Richmond poisoner. So it ran in the family? Well, it would seem to have been a pattern. Um, <laughs> And I could I couldn't believe it. And at the time, that was that wasn't in the public domain. Nobody knew mm. about the connection between the two. So that led me on the path of finding out more about Martha and seeing that that was a huge case in our history. And at the time, there had been no full um, book written on it when I started researching that. Subsequently, there's another book on Martha's well, case. Well, the book is the secret art of poisoning. And it's a fabulous read. Uh, Dr. Samantha Battams is the author. We thank you so much for your time tonight. And I do recommend go out and find The Secret Art of Poisoning. I think you'll find it a good read. Thanks very much. Thank you.